welcome to another virtual science camp and for our uh, Pi Day Eve celebration. As I mentioned uh, in the email, the Saturday sessions are more interactive than the other ones in the week with guest hosts. Uh, so I'll be encouraging you guys, if you're not shy, to turn on your webcams, say hi and participate that way. If you're shy or you didn't clean up or things like that, don't worry, you don't have to show yourself. But anyone who feels like showing themselves, themselves uh, please feel free and encourage to. Uh, feel free to say hi to everyone, either by turning on your microphone or say hi in the chat. Um, and we'll get started in just a minute. So like I mentioned, uh, we'll be going through a whole bunch of different ways to discover, calculate, and estimate Pi. A lot of you guys are probably wondering why we might be celebrating Pi Day Eve as a holiday at all. It's kind of a really obscure and geeky holiday, especially celebrating the, the eve of Pi Day, uh, it coming up. Uh, does anyone know anything about uh, Pi Day history or want to share that before I go over a brief history of that before the experiments? Feel free to take a guess, even if you get it wrong. I think it was first done in San Francisco in like the 1980s, late 1980s, after 1985. That's exactly correct. Thank you, uh, Alex. It was in 1988 with Larry Shaw at the Exploratorium in San Francisco. So San Francisco in the 1980s was a dead on guess. Uh, I'm amazed you came up with that. Uh, and they decided to celebrate it on March 14th because how Americans write the date, they write day then uh, no, the right month, then day, then year. So March 14th would be 314, which are the first three digits of pi. Uh, once they started celebrating it for a couple of years, one of the staff uh, realized or clued in that it's also Einstein's birthday. So what better reason to celebrate something sciencey and mathematical than Einstein's birthday as well? Uh, so I'm going to take you guys through a bunch of, well, three or four simple ways to discover or play around with pi. Uh, about half of them, probably slightly more than half, are based on activities from the Exploratorium Teacher Institute that they do at the museum and that they've been using to celebrate Pi Day since it started. Um, now it's grown to a, like a bigger thing. So there's mathematicians, scientists, enthusiasts all over the world doing interesting and sometimes obscure ways of measuring pi. Uh, to celebrate Pi Day. We'll do pretty like toned down basic ones, but some of them use surprisingly useful techniques for like upper level physics, uh, even though how we do it is pretty easy. Um, so to get started, the first thing I'm gonna ask you to use if you gathered materials and you're following along at home is some string or rope or cord or anything like that. Here I have orange string that I'm realizing, even though it's bright orange, it's not showing up that bright on the camera when I'm holding it in the air. So I'm gonna to switch to my blue that will show up better because it's a bit thicker, but it's really tangled in the mess. Oh, and for this, you need several round objects. I think I said to like grab anything round, like balls, bowls, bottles, cups. Um, I realized after I said that, spherical ones like this melon, or this tennis ball are slightly harder to deal with than cylindrical ones like say this bottle or this jar of Nutella or the peanut butter bottle, but any of them work. So to get started, we're, we're going to start with an activity called cutting pi. And all we're gonna do is compare the diameter and the circumference of a couple of cylindrical things. So I'm just gonna shift my camera so you can see the array of things on my desk. And again, I recommend doing this following along at home to get the most out of the session, hopefully with slightly less tangled string. Um, and I'm gonna take some of this orange string, sorry, blue string. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick one round object. And I'm gonna start with a jar of Nutella uh, because a bunch of people in France, like especially kids joining, probably like Nutella. And the lid is round. The rest of the container is oval, so it's not going to be useful for finding pi. But for the lid, I'm just going to take the circumference of it by tracing around it with the string. 
And again, try and do this with a round object you have at home. And rather than cutting my finger, I'm just gonna pinch where the diameter went and I'm gonna cut that off so I have the diameter there and get the rest of the string out of the way. So I just have one circumference here. That's the distance around the outside. Now, if I did it right, oh, it's a little bit too long. So I'm gonna cut off a little bit there. Okay, and I should have the circumference of my Nutella jar there. And all I'm gonna to do to compare the circumference to the diameter and try and find pi that way now is I'm gonna line it up lengthways across the cylinder and I'm gonna cut it every time I get to one diameter. So here I have one diameter and I'm going to cut that. I'm realizing it would be useful to have more hands. Okay, that's one diameter. Same thing again, two diameters. And I get a third diameter and a tiny bit. This tiny bit is really tiny, but I'm gonna cut that off. And then I'm gonna line that all up on a piece of paper. So we see for the Nutella jar, the circumference was one, two, three, and a bit diameters. And hopefully a lot of you know that the circumference of a circle should equal uh, pi times the diameter. Then we get from this that pi is three and a little bit. If you did this at home, please show your string to show off that you've uh, managed to find that pi this way. And while waiting for maybe some people who are brave enough to show off results, I'll go through the slightly more arduous finding pi by this method with a, with a cantaloupe. Well, it looks like Gabriel showing results Beautiful, yeah. So it looks like there as well, we found that pi should be about three and a little bit. Doing it with the cantaloupe with orange string and I'll go a little bit quicker this way, this time, because you've seen it before. And we want to get to the other experiments without running out of time. So cantaloupe, that was one time across, lining up on top and trying to line things up little bit of a mess with parallax, but here we should find that will be one, two, three, and it's a lot more approximate with the sphere. Remember I said spheres work a lot less easier than uh, cylinders or things with the circular end, but I should find same result with the cantaloupe the distance of the circumference was a, about three and a bit times the circumference of it. If anyone else has results they want to show, please feel free to show them. Does anyone have any questions about this first simple introduction activity to measuring pi? Okay, and with with, oh, and those look like good results. Thank you. Okay, with, with that first one done, I'll move on to a little bit more challenging one. It, the technique is very similar, but the results of it get to be pretty useful. So for this one, I recommended having some tape. I said masking tape is the best you can get, but if you have cello tape or electrical tape, that works as well. Masking tape has the advantage you can easily rip it by hand, like I can just rip it without needing my scissors. So if you don't have an extra set of hands, like if you're on your own, it's easier, but it's totally doable with any kind of tape you have. 
Um, and you'll want a piece of paper for this. Uh, I think I said bring like two or three sheets of A4 paper. You might even want to line it up so you have like two papers together because we'll be making a graph that's a little bit big. So it turns out a little bit bigger for you guys um, because I'm filming what I'm doing and I'm not just doing it for myself. I'm doing it for you guys so that you can see what I'm doing. I'm actually using a big piece of cardboard because then I'll be able to hold that up. You don't need something this big. This is just like for me doing it this big, so I'm showing you. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing. Well, almost the same thing, but instead of cutting up the diameter, we're going to graph it this time. And we're gonna graph it without taking any numerical measurements. And I really like that kind of uh, graphing because it gets away with, like it gets around any potential errors for changing units or not sure how to do the scales or anything like that, because we're just gonna be graphing physical things. So I'm going to flip this down so you can see the axes I'm setting up here. Again, this will be smaller for you if you're just using a piece of paper. And I'm gonna start off with a piece just down one edge and down the other, and those will be the axes of my graph. I really could have chosen a bigger x-axis. I might need to get a bigger, bigger piece of tape for that. I'm gonna leave it as is for now and we'll see how well it goes. And the y-axis, gonna extend it up to the top. So just at right angles to each other and I'm gonna label my axes. And so it's right side up for you. It's actually upside down for me. So hopefully I uh, managed to write upside down okay. If not, I'll flip it around to uh, sort it out. Diameter. Uh, yeah, hopefully that's kind of visible that I wrote diameter there. And here, this will be the circumference. And I don't need to write units here because I'm not actually taking measurements and transferring the, uh, the measurements. Okay, and so there we have axes ready to do a graph. Now we just need to get some data. So that's where all the cylinders come in or like all the circular objects. So I want you to take your tape, start with fairly small objects because it'll be hard to fit big ones on the graph. And you might get frustrated if you just have a piece of paper. So I'm going to start, for example, with this candle. And those of you who were in my uh, virtual camp on face masks, you might remember, remember this exact same candle is the one that I never got around to putting away or putting anywhere else. I'm going to measure the tape against the diameter of it. So we see I just have the way across this circle here. And I'm going to rip that piece of tape and add that to my diameter axis. And I'm gonna start with my origin. The tape isn't infinitely thin, so I'm gonna start with it like on the inside edge of it and measure from there. You could do the inside or outside as long as you're consistent with all the measurements, it doesn't matter. Okay, so that's the diameter of the candle there. The next thing I'm gonna do is measure the circumference. So I'm just gonna wrap the tape around the candle I get it so it's all the way around, one turn around the candle. So that's the circumference of the candle. And I'm gonna add that to my graph. And I'm going to label that first result. This is the candle. So we see the diameter of the candle versus the circumference of the candle, and we've graphed one result so far. Again, you should be doing this at home. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'm happy to try and answer and guide it. 
Uh, if anyone wants to show off their graph, especially to check that you're on the right track, uh, please feel free to turn on your webcam and show it. Uh, if things are going wrong, then I'll try and let you know or point you to the right direction. And as I'm waiting to see if there's any questions or anyone wants to show off their graph, I'm just going to go ahead and graph two or three more round objects. So I get a graph of diameter versus circumference of a couple different objects. Again, staying with things that are pretty small, I'm going to get a water bottle. And this is round enough. I'm going to use it as a circle. You can see it's actually an eight-sided shape. Um, but it's close enough with age that it's worn um, that I'll use that as my next one. So diameter of that, again, the distance across it. Graphing from my zero. Getting the circumference of this bottle. And there's my water bottle. So that's two points on this graph. Okay, now I'll go for a third point on the graph. I'll get to something slightly bigger. So then I'm just growing the graph. Yeah, it's just a glass. Um, you could drink water out of it, but like in France, it's fairly common to use these to measure liquid measurements or solid ones. Um, and I'm gonna take the top end of it, which is bigger diameter than the small end. So just gonna line that up to measure the diameter again. Diameter there. Circumference, distance around the outside. So I've added the glass there. Now I'm going to get one or two more results to finish the graph. But before I do that, I want everyone either looking from a graph you're making at home or looking at my graph to start wondering about what patterns we can see and to predict if we get another result where that might fit. So I'm going to get to something a bit bigger. Here's a bowl. Just, um, bowl you could eat cereal out of or I use it to measure rice and things like that. And following the pattern, looking at this graph, I'm going to predict the circumference would be somewhere around here following an upward trend on the graph. So let's see how that works out. And even slightly higher than I expected, but here we have the bowl with the diameter versus the circumference. Now I'm just going to pause for a minute and ask everyone either in the chat or feel free to turn on your microphone. I want you to tell me what you think we can see or learn from this graph. And if you have a graph at home, please feel free to share your graph as well so we can interpret that. We can see if it's the same or different.
So I'll hold it up, but I've just uh, turned up my screen so you can see me. And, and is anyone brave enough to try and describe the pattern? Oh, okay, so uh, Dan Rose is saying that as the objects get bigger, they have a bigger diameter. Excellent. So we see anytime we have a bigger diameter, we expect a bigger circumference. Is there any more detail we can tell from this graph? For example, if I had an object of diameter, maybe about this big, somewhere in between my glass and my bowl, for example, my Nutella lid, yeah, that's in between, then can we predict where the height would be? Like, would it be maybe here or like if the diameter is somewhere in between, then where would the circumference be? More than glass and less than bowl. More than glass and less than bowl. So it's all following the same pattern. And not only that, but the amount by which it goes up is going to be the same for each of the, those. So I'm going to add one last result, and then we're going to see what we can use these results for. So again, turning it around so it's right side up for you. Going through the Nutella fairly quickly. Sounds like France going through Nutella fairly quickly. Okay, so here we have the diameter. And because it's close to the circumference, it might actually cover the line a little bit, but that's okay. And I didn't realize how close to the size of the glass it was there almost on top of each other, but here's the Nutella jar. And now one thing I want to do with this graph, and I'm gonna grab my black tape so it stands up a little bit differently. I'm just going to add a line connecting the tops of all of these, or as close as I can to it. It might not be dead on, because the tape's not infinitely thin, but if I put this tape down, we can see the tops of all these lines are pretty well connected by this line. It's not a perfect connection, but we get this line of fit that we fit onto our data. For none of this did we ever need to take a numerical value yet. Yet, because now that we have the graph there, now that we have the trend line, I'm going to take two measurements on it, and we're going to be able to get a value of pi. So I'm going to take, let's say, 10 centimeters on the graph, and I'm going to measure from the edge of the tape. So that'll be 10 centimeters. Upside down writing is getting confusing for me. OK, 10 centimeters. And now I'm going to measure how far it goes till when it hits the line. This isn't going to be the best estimation of pi in the world because this distance here is 27.4 centimeters. And you probably know that uh, circumference is two uh, is pi times the diameter. I'm just going to flip this around so it's the right side up for me. I'll, I'll flip it the other way for uh, anyone interested afterwards. And in the line, if we take the diameter for any amount we've taken the line over, and we use that to divide by circumference, so pi equals circumference over diameter, in this case, 27.4 divided by 10. And our value for pi is going to be 2.74. We were actually looking for 
getting close to three, like in 2.7 is kind of close to three. So I'm still reasonably happy with that. And this technique could be used with even more data to get better values of pi. I really like this one because without taking any number measurements for the first majority of this activity, we were still able to get a graph, do a trend line on the graph, and then get a, compare our slope to a known physical constant. And those of you who aren't yet taking high school physics or haven't yet taken high school physics, once you start doing that, like when, once you're doing high school or university physics, one of the most common things you'll do after an experiment is make a graph that has a straight line, find the slope on it and compare it to whatever you're looking for. Um, so this is a skill that hopefully will stay with you for many years to come. Okay, there, there's kind of a lot that went on in making that graph. Please let me know if you have any questions about it before I move on to the next example. And feel free you to use the chat if you don't feel like using your microphone. And it doesn't sound like there's any questions at this point, so I will move on, but stop me and I'm happy to go back if you have any questions. The next one, we're going to need either some matches or some toothpicks for. This one's a really cool one because I'm in Paris and this one is like a famous uh, centuries old Paris one called Buffon's method after the Count Buffon. Uh, and it was originally done with um, toothpicks or like needles, like sewing needles thrown at a wooden floor. And I used my wooden floor in Paris for this, except for two reasons. One, the spacing isn't right for it to work out for an even number of pi. And so we need complicated calculations that it'd just get messy. And the others that like, I would wanna clean my floor really well before showing you, you guys all my floor. Like it's, it's clean, I vacuumed today, but like, Still, the spacing's not right. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take two matches. And if you're doing it with two toothpicks, you can do it with toothpicks. And I'm just gonna measure on a piece of paper. Here, I have a, uh, an A3 piece of paper. It'll work on A4, but it might not fit as well on a camera. So that's why I'm using like a, a big one so you can see it better. And I'm just gonna space two matches end to end and mark that distance so I can draw a line across the whole paper that distance apart. So same thing on the other side. And I guess I should have made it like an even distance from the end of the page. That's almost a matchstick. Okay, so almost a matchstick, lining up two matches and, and drawing a line across. And if you're using A4 paper, you'll just fit one set of lines. I'm gonna fit a double set of lines in case I go beyond the edge. You don't need a double set of lines. Uh, just keep in mind if your matches miss the paper when we're throwing them, you just won't count them one way or another. Okay, so now I have lines that are spaced two match lengths apart two match lengths here, two match lengths there. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna throw matches at the paper and see where they land. And it should be sitting fairly flat. So I'm gonna try and flatten out my graph. Trying to flatten the curve here. Okay, uh, hopefully they won't roll too much. And I'm just gonna throw a couple of matches at the paper. And if they don't land on the paper, I'm not gonna worry too much about it. And I want them to be fairly randomly distributed. Okay, I'm gonna stop. No, I'm gonna throw a couple more.
Okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna count how many matches I've thrown, and I'm gonna count how many are touching a line and how many are not touching a line. So looking at these matches, here this one is crossing this line. So that's one that crossed a line. And this one here, two crossed the line. And then I'm gonna keep counting up. So I'm gonna remember two matches crossed the line. I'll, I'll do a small tally here in case anyone doesn't believe me or in case like we forget or lose count, but two is a small enough number. Then just count the others, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So two out of 18 touched one of the lines. Now I'd like everyone who's doing this at home to try throwing the matches a number of times, then write in the chat, how many crossed a line out of how many you threw? For example, throw 10 or throw 20. And if you have two that cross the line out of 10, write two out of 10. Or if you have five out of 20, five out of 20. And that way we'll get some results. And already I'm seeing some results, perfect. So we have three out of 14, eight out of 16, five out of 15. And surprisingly, if we divide these numbers, so if we do, actually, if we divide the bigger number by the smaller number, then we'll get an estimation of pi. And the estimation of pi will get better the more throws we have. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just going to share my screen. So I'm gonna add all of your results into a spreadsheet that we'll see. Uh, Yes, just getting the screen share working. For some reason, I was having problems with that for a second. Okay, so now you should see a spreadsheet and I'm just going to add all the results that were shared. Meanwhile, if you're still throwing, like if you have time to throw a couple more as I'm uh, writing the results, please add those in as well. So my first result, I throw 18. That was out of two. My estimate of pi is horrible for that. I would think pi is nine in that case, which is completely wrong. Um, Diane Rose threw 14 and three hit it. Oh, I need to fill down the estimate of pi. Her estimate of pi would be a bit more than four. Gabriel 16 and eight. Estimate of pi is two. So any one set of the results isn't going to be great, but if we combine them all together, oh, and that one's good, that's three. And reassuringly, Alex got three as well. Uh, Rachel, one out of 10. And our estimates for pi are all over the place, but if I do a total here, so I'm gonna have this one be the sum of all of the results. For some reason I'm losing my brackets. Okay, sum of all the results up to that point. So if I add even more results, it'll add to the sum and we'll get an even better estimate. And we should find the more results we have, the better our, oh, we can't sum that for pi. I'm gonna fill the formula down that way. Okay, so now our results are 3.6. That's getting better. We're going to add, whoa, Alex did a lot of results. Okay, let's 35 out of 100. That would give an estimate for pi of 3.5. So that's already getting quite good. I'm wrong on that being 3.5. It's 2.8. Uh, Rachel, 2 out of 10. Hussein, 5 out of 12. And we can see as we add more results here, 3.18, that's pretty close. We might get a little bit off with another set of results, but if we were to continue this for an arbitrarily long time, then we should get arbitrarily precise results. And we could talk about the speed at which it converges into our expected value of pi, because if we didn't have a known value of pi to compare it to, then we'd want to ha know how confident we are in the value we're calculating. 
Okay, and we've been busy with different ways of measuring pi now for 40 minutes. Uh, the session's only supposed to last 45 minutes, which leaves five minutes for the last session. Anyone who doesn't mind uh, for the last activity, anyone who doesn't mind sticking around five minutes more after that, we'll actually be able to compare our set of results to the spreadsheet, uh, like to this Buffon's method. But already with Buffon's method, we've confidently got the three in it. Ah, excellent question. Thanks, Paul. So what formula am I using to uh, estimate pi? So I, I kind of skipped the math behind this because uh, the math of it is actually reasonably complicated. But all I'm doing is I'm dividing the number of throws by the number crossing the line. And if anyone's interested in looking up the derivation of this, you can find it online. I can give you a link to uh, like the activity page on the Exploratorium website. Um, but to briefly kind of approximate the math behind it or to give you a starting point for where the math would go, anytime you throw a toothpick onto the, the paper, its position can be described by the distance from one of the lines to the next, and its orientation can be described as an angle. And if you integrate, now integral math gets a little, little complicated, which is why I'm skipping it. But if you integrate the probability that the position of it uh, vertically, or like in this way, uh, will coincide with an orientation where it'll cross the line, um, the probability of it crossing the line is relating to the angle. So we get pi coming out of it that way. And we have one over pi chance that it'll be on one of the lines. Um, but we won't dwell on that because the math behind that is a little more complicated and I wanna rush to the last, uh, last activity. So that's going to involve graph paper, either with big squares or small squares. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for this. Uh, the first way that we do it is, and I'll do it with big squares because it's a lot easier to see, but the value will be less precise. I'm going to take a circle and it can be any circle that I decide to trace. And I'm just gonna line it up so it's easy to line up from like one set of squares. Trace it around. And we're going to be using the uh, formula for the area of a circle being that area equals pi r squared. So that's r times r. And so if we look inside the circle, if we count the number of squares for a circle of, in this case, it's radius. Here we see the diameter goes across five squares. So r equals 2.5. And if we count the number of squares here that's filled in, here we have like a bit of a square. Here we have most, so one, two, three, works out around. And we see how this isn't too precise because there's some rounding. This is most of a fourth square, five, six, seven, eh, seven and almost eight. We'll take that off from one later, but like 7.5, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, uh, rather than counting to 13, let's round it to 12 with this and that, uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, because we were a little bit more there, 17, 18, 19. So the area is roughly 19. Nineteen uh, square squares, uh, squares squared. Um, arbitrary units, these don't work out to be centimeters or anything um, that works out well. Okay, so that's our area. If we compare that to pi times 2.5 squared, then we pull pi out, pi, and if the math goes a bit quick for you, don't worry too much. Pi equals 19 over 2.5 squared. 2.5 squared is 6.25. 6.25 times three is 18.75. So this equals three point something small. Uh, that math in my head, um, I'm gonna round it to 3.1. 
which isn't a bad estimation of pi, but there was a lot of kind of messy business saying, well, we're counting this as part of a square, this not really as part of a square. So we'll get to another method, which is where this leads into big numbers and where programming will become useful, which is where I said we'd leave off with this. So I'm going to contain this circle within a square and we'll be able to easily know the area of the square. That green really isn't showing up well, so I'm just gonna draw the square just beyond the line. Okay, and whatever the radius is, so even if we don't care about the units, if we just say radius equals r, or let's say it's equal to one unit, and our unit will be the radius of the circle unit, then each side of the square will have r and r, or the area of square will be 2r all squared, or 4r squared, area of square. Whereas the area of the circle is r pi r squared again. And this is going a little bit fast. Um, if we compare the area of the circle to the area of the square, then we'll get four pi r squared over pi r squared. The area of the square cancels out and we can get uh, pi calculated that way. So to, yeah, I'll just write the calculations in blue here. If we turn them into fractions, so we divide the two, we can cross multiply out and we can get that pi, oh, r squared cancels, pi equals four times the area of the circle or the area of the square. How this becomes useful is because the uh, most popular like original algorithm used for computers to calculate digits of pi. It's a very inefficient algorithm, so it's not actually used that often, but it was used historically to compare processing speeds of uh, computers. If we do a, anything to measure the area of the circle and we compare it to the square, all we need to do is divide them out, multiply by four, uh, and we get a value for pi. To do that, we're gonna look at the probability of something landing in the circle. So I'm just going to drop my marker on the paper and I'm going to look at how many times the drop falls within the circle compared to how many drops total fall within the square. If this seems familiar to any of you who were at the modeling magnification virtual camp in January, that's not by coincidence. This is the exact same method we were using to model the Rutherford model of the, uh, sorry, not the Rutherford model of the atom, the Rutherford gold foil experiment. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna count up the number of times that the dot fell within the circle compared to the total number of times it fell within the bigger square. And those will be an estimate of the area of the circle compared to the area of the square. And if I repeat it for more and more and more and more drops, then we'll get a more and more and more and more precise value of pi. With the number of drops I have now, we're probably not gonna even get one digit of pi, um, correct. So these dots outside of the circle, they're outside of our interest, we're not gonna count them. Uh, we have one, two that are within the square but not in the circle. And in the circle, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. And this one's just kind of barely on the line. 
So, uh, so that's 12. So with our first round of numbers, we have 12 divided by two more than 12 divided by 14. I'm horrible at writing upside down. So I'm gonna put that right side up for me for a second. 12 divided by 14. Pi equals 12 divided by 14 times four, which equals 48 divided by four, 48 divided by four, uh, sorry, 48 divided by 14 uh, gives us about 3.4, which is honestly a lot better than we'd statistically get with only 12 drops. Um, so that method is working surprisingly well. I had planned a Google form to have you guys share your results for this. Oh, thousand inches of pie. Thanks, Alex. Um, so I had had a Google form to get results from this, but I'm not going to take time for that. I'm just going to skip to the results because that's like kind of where we were going uh, with this. So if we look at a model of that. What I've done in this spreadsheet, I've just modeled a circle. The equation of a circle will be x squared plus y squared equals one. And I'm just considering a quarter of a circle for now. Um, taking a random number and in any spreadsheet, your formula for a random number will just be rand or random with two brackets, random number for x between zero and one random number for y between zero and one. And the equivalent of that on this diagram would be if I were, if I were looking at this quarter of a circle, the x value here between zero and one times the radius. So looking at any random number of where it dropped there, the y value, any random number of where it dropped there. And if it's within the circle, x squared plus y squared will be less than or equal to one here. And if it's bigger than or equal to one, then it'll have fallen out here. And we can compare those two uh, totals. So all I've done on this spreadsheet is have a random x, a random y, so that's simulating our draw. We have comparing x squared plus y squared here. This one would have fallen within the circle. This one would have been beyond the circle, like the, this row here this one beyond the circle, this one within the circle, and so on. And just a formula that counts the number of times it was dropped, the number that's in the circle, then our estimation of pi. And the handy thing about a spreadsheet is we can quickly calculate thousands of values, and we can do that time after time again. Every time I press enter, it's going to recalculate new random values. So we have a whole bunch of a thousand new random drops and here we have um, 771 out of 999 were in the circle. That gives us a value of pi of 3.09. If we drop it again, we have 784 fell within the circle, 3.14, beautiful value of pi. Just by chance, it was that dead on. Uh, another value of pi, and we can keep doing 1,000 drops. Uh, just using a computer like this. And spreadsheets are a really good transition into the idea of coding things, because if you want to get to more than a thousand, then on the spreadsheet, like we can't easily see these thousand values. It's just a lot of numbers there. Um, so we might want to write a program so we can arbitrarily tell it, do it 10,000 times, do it a hundred thousand times, do it a million times, do it a billion times. And doing it a billion times would actually take a fair amount of time to do, uh, but we can scale it up that way. Uh, so I wanted to finish off with this method of pi because it gets to the idea that we can use computers to calculate it. It's very easy to do with spreadsheets. Uh, you should be able to do the, that on your own. Um, and in two weeks, uh, I'm going to have a session on an intro to coding. Uh, if anyone has any suggestions or input so I can get an idea of what level of coding most of you are at. I'm going to aim it probably as basic as possible. 
because the main reason for having an intro to coding session is just to prepare for anyone who is wanting to attend the one the next Tuesday on the Mon Monte Carlo method from the Joint Institute of Nuclear Research, where they'll be going through some programming. And if you have no notions of any programming whatsoever, you might be a little lost for that. Um, so does anyone have any requests or suggestions like which programming languages you prefer to use? Um, it'll probably be something to program this same problem uh, to have some sense of continuity. And also it's a very simple historic problem. Uh, Hussein, it looks like you're raising your hand. If you have something to say, please feel free to say either in the chat or with your microphone. Uh, can you show me, uh, can you show again the other paper, the other uh, paper, not uh, the square, the other paper? Uh, yeah. Uh, was it this one or was it the graph? Which did you want to see again? Sorry, I, I didn't hear. Which did you want to see? Yes, yes, this paper. Okay, and I'll, I'll keep that on the screen for a minute. Um, anyone else? For the coding thing, um, to give you an idea of where I'm at, we've just started doing it in uh, my class in technology. Uh, and we've literally just started like having an idea of what we have to put in a coding program. And, and are you doing block coding or lines of code? Uh, we're doing, I think it's lines of code, yeah, where we're doing like start and then we keep going under. Obviously, I'm doing it in French though, so. Oh, yeah, but even, even in French, a lot of the command terms, for, well, no, maybe for yeah, any... introductory languages, they've translated them. Yeah, they really translated the them. For, like for most medium to advanced level programming, people learning programming around the world learn English or at least learn yeah. English command to them. Um, but yeah, for like introductory middle school, they, they might translate it, which is an unnecessary hassle. <laughs> um, do, do you know what language it is you're using? I think it's Python. Okay. In a Python's a really good one to, to start with. So if I'm doing like lines of code for that, I'll probably do that. A lot of people are more familiar with blocks of code, like things like Scratch, but that's- Yeah, Scratch more, I'm really good at, but that's less. That's, yeah, I'm like more for moving things uh, rather than mm. variables. You can have variables, but like it kind of pushes the practicality of it. Yeah, well, I made I've made loads of games using Scratch. It's really useful. Like, <laughs> you just make a game. Uh, Scratch and then is not it. difficult. Scratch is easy. So, so I'm getting the feeling that if if it was possible to do a good enough introduction to Scratch, people would already be quite familiar with that. Um, yeah. So. So I'll, I'll play around and see, but it'll it'll probably either be Scratch or Python um, that we end up having for that one. Um, does does anyone have any questions about anything I showed before I uh, conclude and close the session? Okay, cool. Um, may and, I ask something? Uh, yeah, yeah, please do. Uh, it's not a question, but it's a suggestion. Uh, yeah. Can you guys send a mail to the us more early like before two days or three days whatever because i'm not seeing it uh and i'm missing some days oh okay yeah i if if that's more useful for people then yeah i can send it whenever would be the most useful for for everyone receiving it uh i thought the day of would be handy for most people um but if it's Better for people if it's like two or three days ahead, then definitely that uh, that can be done. Is there anyone who would be interested in reminders both a couple days ahead of time and the same day, or is that too many emails filling up your inbox? Uh, I'm saying like before a reminder, then in the day of the meeting, uh, the real um, meeting ID would be good. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, thank you for that feedback. That's, that's useful to know that it'd be uh, handy for you guys. So I'll, I'll start doing that. Uh, thanks for that suggestion. Oh, I had a quick question. 
I was wondering, why is it today Pi Day, uh, sorry, tomorrow Pi Day, and not uh, the 22nd of July? Because if you divide 22 by 7, it makes Pi. I think that would be a better candidate for Pi Day. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the short answers are, I don't know. It wasn't up to me. And it was the people at the Exploratorium who did it. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I, I think, and if you look on the Wikipedia for Pi Day, I think it names July 22nd as Pi Estimation Day. Like yeah. you'll find about five, maybe 10 different Pi related holidays, most of which there's very few people who actually celebrate, but the 22nd of July, that does have some kind of named Pi Day. Mm. Yeah. Okay, and on. On that note, I think I'll, I'll uh, close things. So I'll wish everyone a happy Pi Day Eve again and happy Pi Day tomorrow. And I hope to see you all back for more uh, virtual science camp soon. All right. Have a good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening.